It's weird that I can't see the eraser anymore. I have no idea what that was about. So if it's we're 94% confidence, uh, that means that 9 out of 10 times, the population mean is in that range. Um, and so this is the one time we'll get uh, a sample uh, where we're taking a group and finding that um, the mean wasn't actually in that, the range that we're going to. So we're going to say, when we're doing this, we're going to say, the rain, the, we're 90% confident that the population mean or population distribution is in this range of numbers. Okay, which, and like I said, all that means is that if we did this over and over and over again, you know, millions of times, nine times out of ten, we would have the population mean in or population proportion in that space. Okay, and this one time here, this one time, we would not. And that's okay. We can be wrong. So statistics is a, is a math where being wrong is you, you do all the work and you're still wrong, get the wrong answer, and that's okay, because you're not being perfect. You're basing it upon samples, and samples are not the population, so you may have inaccurate data, all right? And so that's why when we go all the way back to chapter one, we talk about getting good representative data. We want to make sure that we're taught, we're finding all the stuff that we need. So we want to make sure that we're getting, trying to get everybody. So uh, the current thing was obviously COVID-19. They were doing um, human testing on the the um, vaccine, and they found out that they didn't have enough um, minority um, people in the test. So they had to redo the whole thing, right? Because they were like, oh, well, we found that it worked for this group, and when this group, they're like, oh, we're not really sure if it works for this group, so we don't because we don't have enough data. We need to do more testing, so they're gonna they do more testing and can get a better result, right? Because they want to be representative of the population, and those things happen in all things that they do. Asking, uh, you know, who you're going to vote for for president, we again want to make sure that we're representative. We don't want to just ask. Um, well, we really have to ask all people in all 50 states because we have 50 elections as opposed to a single election, um, which people have a hard time understanding that it's not a popular vote. It is um, the it's, it's 50 popular votes. And then from there, we have the Electoral College based upon who wins. So those things. So if we were asking, you know, who are you going to vote for president? If I just asked everybody in the class, I wouldn't get a very good sample. I know, you know, you know, of Middlesex students, maybe I'd have a decent sample. But, you know, obviously it's small, but it's, it's a sample. But I wouldn't be able to use my results here to figure out what's happening in California or Texas. So we have to make sure that we're asking the, the right people for information. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so when we talk about confidence, so when we talk about the confidence intervals, we are just saying, you know, based upon our sample, this is what we think is happening. All right. Um, just trying to think of other things that are going to happen in this that need explanation uh, before I um, go through. Uh, trying to think. Um, I can't think of anything. So um, the formula for uh, the 
for T is the same as it was for Z for last week. So that's that's nice. Um, except they talk about the degrees of freedom. So degrees of freedom are always n minus one in well, not always n minus one. Um, it depends upon how many variables we have. So like if we have two variables, it's going to be n minus two uh, because we have two variables that we're taking away. Um, and when we look at another statistic, it's going to be the rows times the column. But they're still you know row minus one and, and columns minus one. But in this case, we only have one column of data. So that's why we have n minus one. Um, and what that means is that if I have four things, Actually, I'll do five things. Right? If I have five people running a race, right? We're coming in first. Any one of these people could come in first. Does everybody agree with that? So I could have either A, yeah, that's true. B, yes, B, I agree. or E first. And so if C comes in first, he's no longer an option. And so for second, I have four people that could be picked. I'll pick A. And then for third, I have three people that could come in. So I'll pick E. And for fourth place, I have two people that could come in. But for last place, I don't have a choice. This person has to be in last place if everybody else has placed in the race. He, there's no option. I, I just have to wait for his time, but it doesn't matter. He's going to be last. So there's no choice in that. There's no freedom of picking at that point. And that's where degrees of freedom comes from, is if we have, no matter how many things we have, the last, per, the last thing has to be chosen last. It's kind of like, when you were playing um, kickball as a kid and you didn't want to be the last one chosen, well, you're like, oh, well, I guess I'm taking Billy because he's all that's left. Or, hey, can Susie, can your sister, can your four year old sister Susie come out and play? And they're like, no, she's napping. So they're like, I right, fine, we'll take Billy. You know, it, it's, it's that kind of thing. It's, you know, there's no choices left, so you're the choice. Right? And that's what degrees of freedom is, is that that's why we reduce it by one. Um, and like I said, it makes for a wider curve. So if this is the normal distribution, this is going to be the t distribution because there's bigger disparities. You know, we have the standard deviation coming in, and we have this degrees of freedom, which plays with the n, right? And all of those things are going to come into play and work on this. Um, the formula is still the same. T is equal to x bar minus mu over, in this case, it's going to be the standard the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And we always write degrees of freedom down here so that they know how many degrees of freedom, how big the sample size was. And so we use this same formula as we did with the z distribution. Obviously, that was x bar minus mu over sigma divided by the square root of n. So these, the, the only thing that's changed is that we're using the sample standard deviation versus the population standard deviation because we don't know this one. All right? And we're, we're using a degrees of freedom to change the outcomes a little bit based upon our graph. All right? And so what we would do is we'd look to see how many degrees of freedom we have. And it doesn't give us all the points anymore. What it does is it gives us specific spaces because there'd be too many graphs. Like we'd have a single table for each one of these things for all the possible outcomes. So because we only care about specific certain spaces under the term, under the graph, that's why we're only looking at these particular ones. Whereas in the Z distribution, we found the Z score and said, okay, here's what we're looking for. In this, we're finding the value and saying, okay, well, this is the point that we would be using 
to calculate the area behind this and we're not going to find all the rest of this stuff because it doesn't matter all these anything in between these areas doesn't really matter for us all right um but we're still going to use this same formula and like i said again we're going to use our calculator which isn't going to do any of that it's just going to give us um our distribution so if i turn it on i go to second distribution and we're not using the normal distribution anymore we're using the t distribution so here's the t cdf and if you have a newer calculator you'll have this inverse t which isn't on the older ones all right so make sure that you're you know, but most cases but most things we're just going to find this t cdf we're going to find the area under the curve based upon a number we're not going to be looking for tell you what is the 50th percentile or 57th percentile? They're not going to ask you that. They're going to ask, say, here's the number, what space is under that? And technically, we're not even going to do this in this chapter. We're going to do, it's not in this one. It's actually in stats and tests. And we're going to do these intervals. So we're going to use the Z interval, the T interval. Uh, next week, we're going to use these two sample T and Z intervals and two sample proportion intervals. But for this week, we're going to use 7, 8, and A, you know, because there's only one thing that we're looking at. We're looking at one Z interval, one T interval, or one proportion Z interval. So proportions always use Z, no matter what. They're always using Z. Okay, whereas means could use Z or T depending upon whether we know the standard deviation or the population standard deviation. So depending upon what we know is what we're going to use for the interval. But uh, if we're finding out we're doing a proportion, we're always going to do Z. Okay, we don't have any choices. And you'll know which it is because, again, it's going to talk about means and standard deviations or what this is a percentile. You know, this is a percent, you know, 62% of the population population says this is it true and we test it off of that all right and we don't not we're not going to calculate these pieces we're just going to come into our calculus and say hey give us an answer all right so there's no handy work that you have to learn for formulas and stuff like that so this is again one of these parts of the class that people like because they don't have to remember any formulas there's no formulas to remember you just have to remember which one are you using all right and when we do intervals, okay, when we do uh, confidence intervals, we need to know stuff. We need to know what is the X bar that we're looking at? What is the standard deviation that we're looking at? Is it the sample or the population? What is the N that we're looking at? What's the sample size? What is N minus one? Um, if we're, when we're doing a proportion, What is the x that we're looking at? What is the population proportion? What is the q? What is this? Is this is the percent of success? What is the percent of fail, probability of failure that we're looking at as well? So we need to know those pieces um, for when we're doing this. And remember, p is success, and one minus p is q. That's failure. So if they tell you that uh, here, uh, 420 drivers. Uh, we asked 420 drivers and 320 of them so they wear the seatbelt. The other 100 don't wear a seatbelt. So we need to we should know Q because to do if we're doing the math by hand, we need to know Q. All right. And every once in a while, they're going to have us do that, do stuff like that. So in um, the next chapter where we're doing um, hypothesis testing, we need to know Q. So it's always best to write pieces out and say, okay. That's what they're doing here. They're writing them out and giving you the information. That way you have it on hand. So when you need to use it, you can go back to it and go, oh, here's the numbers that I Okay. So that's kind of always the case when you're doing these things is have the information that you have been given and write it down. You know, here they're writing it down. All right. So that way we can use it and look back at it later. We don't have to go back to the whole problem and find the stuff. You know, we've kind of got an idea of what it is. So we always read the problem, but just to, to get through the whole thing, and then read it to find information. 
and then from there we have to figure out well what are we doing with that information so we we're finding we're pulling out the information the next thing is well what do they want us to do so um, the question is probably going to be in these cases like usually they write all the stuff together but um, what is they want to you know eventually they're going to know what is the the interval of this you know, how long does it take between what and what and um, they would then use that information for a purpose, okay? And interestingly, I was taught this after doing hypothesis testing because this is kind of the check for hypothesis testing. So this is like we're learning subtraction before we learn addition. But it's useful because you have an idea of what it is and you understand it, and then you're like, oh, I'm doing a hypothesis test. I can check because if you use this to do hypothesis tests, say my hypothesis is that um, so here's the amount of time my, but we were thinking that it takes on average 18 hours to do a, a, a income tax uh, build uh, income taxes and then we did a sample and we got this information is 18 hours really true because that's what we've been charging you know and our fee is we're going to we charge you for 18 hours whether it takes longer or not and then you're like, oh, well, really, it takes somewhere between 20 and 25 hours. So we're actually undercharging. We should raise our rates, you know, or we're overcharging, and we should, and that's okay. We're going to be fine with that. We're just not going to let anybody know. We're going to take it slower, guys, you know. So those are what we would look at for this. All right. This also has to do with um, whenever companies sue you, sue whenever people sue companies for things like, oh. Um, the temperature in my coffee was too hot, and I burned myself. Right? You all know that that's a real case, correct? That actually happened. Yes, that's why it's all labeled on coffee cups. And right, stuff. that coffee is hot, and that's why you have labels on everything. Your hair with this in the shower. Do not um, anything. This can anytime you see your children. Exactly. Anytime you see something really <laughs> stupid on a package, it's because you did it already. And, and then they sued because they were just morons. Like, you know, dude, you're in the shower. Drying your hair doesn't make any sense. Wait till you're done. All right. But who's the it's moron, still getting really? wet. The person that? that sued? I said, who's the moron, it, really? They're the ones sitting with millions of dollars now. Well, <laughs> yeah, but in, in that case, they actually found that McDonald's was making their coffees way too hot. It was like 180 degrees. Um, and the reason they were making it so hot was because it had to sit for long periods of time, so it would cool down. But uh, and the woman got it like right off the right out of you know right when it finished, so it was too hot to drink, and she spilled it and got horrible burns. You know, it was McDonald's fault. <laughs> you know, because we usually think of coffee should be like in a certain range, like a hundred and hundred to a hundred and 25 degrees or something like that. Like I said, they were serving it at 180 degrees. So it's almost boiling. So you can't, it's not, you, you can't drink, you will burn yourself. But they, like I said, they thought, well, we put it out, we, we make it, and then it sits out for hours. So we want to be able to keep using it. And then, so it's going to have a long lifespan. But the problem was they were serving it right away. And this woman burned herself. And they, that's why they found McDonald's negligent. And that's why they put on there that this is too hot this is hot and that they now have to make the coffees not as hot you know and yes they can still make it a little hotter and sit it out but they can't make it as hot as they were making it and so while it seems like a frivolous dumb lawsuit it was actually there was actually a purpose behind it like they were actually making danger coffee dangerously hot <laughs> you know um but yeah i mean so those things happen you know you know but most cases it's just stupidity. You know, don't chew on the, um, you know, we have paint chips. That we have lead in the paint chips. Who's, why are we expecting kids to be eating the furniture? You know, nobody should be eating the window tiles, but they were. So they then, paint manufacturers got sued because there was lead in the paint because the kids were eating the paint chips. Well, shouldn't you be watching your kid and not letting him eat the paint chips? I, I like... But that was the problem. Like it should, the paint shouldn't have been chipping in the first place. But 
These are houses that are hundreds of years old, so of course it's going to change. It isn't supposed to last that long, you know. But and they were still putting lead in it, you know, in the 70s, and so they were like, oh, we need to take this out. Or um, when Ray Bradbury wrote his book Fahrenheit 451, they thought it would be really funny to wrap it in asbestos so people couldn't burn the book. And then they found out that asbestos causes cancer. So they got sued for making a book covered in asbestos and selling it to people, um, the publisher. And they were like, oh, well, we didn't know it was a cancer-causing agent at the time. We thought it was funny because people used asbestos to put things, make things fireproof. Well, that didn't matter to the, the, the they were still suing. And so that's what people like to do. They like to sue. Um, and, you know, they're like, oh, we'll, we'll take it off. They recalled all the books and uh, like they weren't held negligent you know, monetarily, but they were, you know, uh, they had to replace all the books and take them off the shelves. So those kinds of things happen, you know. Um, it also has to do with uh, if you look at your cereal box or your um, your chips and it says that there's so many ounces in it and there aren't like you get a bag of chips that has that says it's 16 ounces and you measure it and you get 14 ounces you know you can they will then sue companies for for shorting um chips because what they look at is you know is this a an, an anomaly or is this a bunch of things so we don't take one value we never look at one we always look at a, an average of a large group because as we saw that the chances of a large group is changing from where the uh, population mean is shouldn't be that big. And the larger your sample, the more likely it is to be closer to where the mean is supposed to, the population mean is supposed to be. So they wouldn't look at a single bag of chips that had 14 ounces. They'd look at hundreds of bags and say, is the average 14 ounces? And if the answer is yes, then they'll take a lawsuit, make a lawsuit, and say, "Hey, you're not, you're shortchanging the the people," and they'll be like, "Fine, we'll put more chips in the bag," and and the the lawyer will take all of the money, and um, everybody will get a free bag of chips that wants it. Um, so those things are what they do. And has anybody seen Aaron Brockovich? Maybe Aaron Brockovich. No. All right. Um, so Aaron Brockovich yeah, was, the, um, company. right, they sold, uh, G electrics, electronic electric in, um, uh, California because they were dumping waste in an area and they were getting lots of kids in that area, like some pods in that, in those spaces with uh, kids getting leukemia. And it was, Oh, I think he lost connection. Sorry, my cat sat on my uh, keep my mouse pad and, and turned everything off. So, um, still recording? This is still recording. All right, good. Uh, share screen. Share screen. I don't think there's any audio I need. Um, so they would uh, they sued because there was a large discrepancy of. Um, cases of uh, leukemia and they were like this shouldn't be happening in this area in this larger space so they looked at other spaces and said well, what's the proportion of leukemia cases or whatever kind of cancer was like was leukemia uh in areas and they said we are so far ahead away from that and the same thing happened with the civil action it was a similar type of thing they looked and saw that the proportion of people getting cancer in Woburn was so much higher than everywhere else around it that something was wrong, and they had to figure out well what it was, and they would then they then you know sued the companies that were make, causing 
the um, cancer to happen. So that's what they do with those things. I don't want that one. I need this right here. And I'll put that back where it was. I'll put this back where it was. And the other thing they talk about in this chapter is finding sample size. And we'll go into that quickly after when we get to it. But you'll be surprised at how many people you actually need to survey to get a decent answer on things. Um, so um, here the first question is, uh, suppose that an accounting firm does a study to uh, see how long it takes to complete a tax return. And they survey 200 people, and they find the sample mean is 22.8. And they know the population standard deviation is 6.4. So because the population standard deviation is known, then they're going to use the um, Z distribution. And uh, they say that the population distribution is assumed to be normal. So they don't have to say this because we're using samples. but it helps. All right. It just says, okay, well, we're going to use the Z distribution because we know this is normal and we know this is um, the sample size, that the, we know the population standard deviation. And uh, then they say, well, if you're using the T distribution, explain, you know, um, you may also assume that it's normally distributed. So we're always assuming that sample sizes, whenever we get sample means, we know that they're supposed to be normally distributed because that's how sample means work. So. It's kind of just extra text that doesn't need to be there. And then so we're looking through. And luckily, le nicely in this book, most of the uh, numbers that we care about are going to be in red. So they're fairly easy to find. Um, what was the mean, the sample mean? Oh, right, 22.8. What was the population standard deviation? They told us that, 6.4. And what is the sample size? 200. So they've given us those things. We're just pulling out the information because we're going to need it to do a um, to do a distribution. To do a um, I can't think of uh, confidence intervals. And then what does x and x bar mean? You should know this by now, so I'm not even, and there's only four of them, so I'm not going to go into it. You should know how to do that by now. Um, what distribution are we going to look at? Well, because this is, we know the population standard deviation, that tells us that it's normally distributed. And so we have all these options here, but because we know the population standard deviation and we know the mean and they tell us that it's normally distributed, um, then we know that's why we're picking the n. And then again, this goes back to the last chapters, you know, where the mean and the standard deviation. Now remember, this standard deviation is the standard deviation because this is population, we're doing sample means. Because notice we're looking at the sample means. This is going to be sigma divided by the square root of n. All right, so we take, I can quit, we take this 6.4 and we divide it by the square root, in my case, of 200. And that's where, and that tells us two decimal places, so that's all we care about is the four or five, all right? So depending upon what your numbers are, obviously you're gonna get different values, but that's how you solve it. You're taking the standard deviation, you're taking the sigma, and dividing by the square root of n in these cases. And why do we use what we used? Well, we're using the normal, well, we're not using the t distribution, so those two don't make any sense. Um, normal distribution should be used because the mean is given. Well, the mean's always given. Right? We know the, the sample mean is always given. Right? It's necessary. But we're using it because we know the population standard deviation. What they should have had was, you know, sample standard deviation is given and population standard deviation is given, um, is known. So because we know the population standard deviation, that's why we're using a normal distribution and not the, the, the t distribution. 
Then they ask us to calculate a 90% confidence interval. So I'm going to do this part first. Uh, sorry, this part here first. Um, I know what I can do. Let me, where is my, I'll just use this one. We'll see if this works on our whiteboard. It does. Nice. And I can make it bigger. OK. So the reason for these things here, that's kind of cool. I'm very happy with that. Um, so they're asking, so when we're looking at the graph, 90% of the data, because this is a 90% confidence interval, this here. Come on. Let me do stuff. I think it might be letting you do stuff because you need to click place image. Where is it? Uh, underneath the picture you have, there's the oh, I see. Button. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did, see, it helps to read. That, that's always a good reading. Reading is, 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 is fundamental, and I don't always do it. See, we're like, oh, it's not working. All right. So once I've, so this normal distribution, this year, they're telling us is 90% because that's, what we're doing, we're looking at a 90% confidence interval. So this middle space, this is going to be where the mean is. And then 90% of the data is between two numbers. So that's why this one here is 90. And then this alpha over 2, alpha is just what's left over, is the error. All right. So because we have error on both sides, we have to divide it by two. So if this is 90%, what's left over? Ten percent. Ten percent. All right. So we can we're wrong ten percent of the time, and sometimes we're too low. And sometimes we're too high. And because this is a normal curve, it's, it's um, symmetric. So those things are equally distributed. So 5% of the time, we're too low. 5% of the time, we're too high in this range. OK? So the, the population mean could be in any one of these spaces. We don't know. But with our math that we're going to do, 5% of the time, the population mean will be over here, will be wrong. And the population mean will be over here. Five percent of the time, population mean would, would be over here, but it's going to be in this range somewhere. This has to be a hundred percent. Happy? You like me in the way? I'm moving this back so I'm not sitting on my keyboard. All right. So we have to look and say that's why these become you know, ten percent divided by two is five percent, and they want it in decimal form. So that's why this is 0.90, this is 0 0.05, and this is 0 0.05. Okay. The other thing, um, when we get these answers, this is our confidence, and they're going to be the same numbers as those two. Okay. So this is my lower bound, this is my upper bound. So 90% of the data is between these two numbers, all right? And so we have to find it. We're going to use our calculator, and we're going to go to our math thing so I can get my numbers. And so I had, oh, turn this on. And again, it's in stat. Even though the t distribution is in distributions, we're using, we're going to go to stat and over to tests. And 
because this is a z normal distribution, we're doing a z interval. So number seven. And um, and we have to tell whether or not we have data or statistics. So if we have a list of numbers, that's when we're dealing with data. Right now we have statistics. We will have a data at some point. So we click over to get the stats, hit enter, and it changes and says, well, what's the standard deviation? What's the uh, mean? What's the sample mean? What's our sample size? Now when we do uh, the T distribution, it changes the order of these. So make sure you're aware of which one you're doing and which numbers you're putting in. It's dumb that they change the order, but they change the order. So we come down and we have stats. So our sample, our population standard deviation is 6.4. My mean is 22.8. My sample size is 200. Oops. 200. And then my confidence level, this, that's all this is, is confidence level. And instead of confidence interval, it's confidence level. That just to be difficult. So it's 0.90. And then I go to calculate. I believe both calculators, like all calculators, have this table in there where you're putting the information. You don't have to um, monkey around with what it is. And it gives you your range 22.056 and 23.554. Okay. And so they want two decimal places. So you just round to two decimal places. Here's your mean, here's your sample size. So based upon this information, and the standard deviation, which they don't give you, um, your you believe that the actual average time is somewhere in this range, and that's what this number, these two numbers, and these two numbers are. You really need to be hitting me in the face. Can can you just sit there? Here, nugget, sit here. Come on, right here. Okay. The last thing they ask you to do is calculate the error bound. And the error bound is just the error. Um, what is the boundary? How far away from the mean are each of these numbers? And so the easiest way to get that is take these two numbers and subtract them. So 23.54 minus 22.06, and then divide that by two. Because what they're, the actual way to get this interval is we take the mean, we take x bar and add and subtract our error bound. Our error boundaries from to and from this number. And to get this error boundaries, we uh, we have to use the table, we have to use this information, we do some math, and we get this value. And then from that value, we then add it subtracted to the mean, right? But we, they're never asking you to, to do any of the, the, this by hand, they're just asking you, but they are asking, well, how far on either side is this, how big is this number? How big is this error boundary? And so it's just, the, it's really, Whatever our mean was, so our mean was uh, 22 point something. Um, let me bring back my calculator. Oh, of course, it's not there. I'll go to my tests because I don't feel like going back to. So my mean was 22.8. And if I add, the other way to do it is take your mean and subtract it from your higher bound or subtract your lower bound from it. So if I subtracted 22.8, 23.54 minus 22.8, I would get this number. If I did 22.06 take, taken away from 22.8, I would get this number. Or if I subtract these two numbers and then divide by two, I'll get this number. So. Whichever way makes you happy is what you do. Like you just pick the one that you like. Um, I usually like taking these two numbers and just dividing, subtracting them and divide by two, just because I have them already anyway. And um, 
I don't know. That's just that's just me. Um, but if you only know one of them, then obviously you would subtract it from the mean from it, and then find to find that value. All right. But you're going to do that over and over and over again. It's not going to change. It's scary. They have you do this a bunch of times, actually. You learn some statistics? Are you going to be statistics cat? So if the firm wishes to increase its confidence but and keep the error bound the same, what should it do? So if you're increasing the confidence, you're increasing your um, confidence level. Here you're going to increase this to 95%. So they want to keep the same error bound. So if they do that, they have to increase the number of people that they survey. Right. If they wanted, if they were going to lower this, then they have to, then they would keep everything else the same. They'd have to just lower the people number of people they surveyed. But since they've already surveyed 200 people, why lower it? I don't. It doesn't really make any sense. Um, and then here is another one. If they keep the error the same and only survey 49 people, what happens? Well. What happens is is that and keep the same um, keep the same error bound. So if they few, surveyed fewer, that's this one. They're decreasing the number of people they survey. They're less confident in their answer. And so what happens is this range actually gets larger. So the um, less confident you are, the larger your range is. All right. And I can prove this to you. All right. If I want to be um, if I, so. There's a couple ways you can do this. If if you want to be perfectly confident that a, a number is in your range, you just have a giant range. Okay. So if I asked you how many town city towns are there in Massachusetts, and I want you to be a hundred percent confident that you have the right answer, right? You're not going to give me one number. You're going to give me a range. And if you don't know, you're going to give me a giant range. But if you're fairly sure you already know the answer, you can give me a smaller range. All right? And it depends upon that. So your range would depend upon how confident you are in the answer and um, how big the number is, you know, to begin with. So, um, and those kinds of things happen. So does anybody know how many towns, cities and towns there are in Massachusetts? Anyone want to take a guess? You're all chicken? Bark, 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 bark. Without looking it up on on Google, I just looked it up, so now I can't answer. <laughs> but see, I told you you don't need to look it up. You can just give me a range, right? Because I'm not looking for a specific number. I want you to be confident that your answer is in there. So you're giving me a confidence interval, right? And so, which is more likely to have the correct answer in it? Um, if I told you there are 256 towns, cities and towns in the uh, in, in Massachusetts, or if I say that there's between 100 and 300 towns in Massachusetts, which one is more likely to have the right answer? 100 to 300. 100 to 300. Does it have the right answer? No. But I'm more likely, to, I'm more confident in my range. Okay. If I said it's 100 to 300 or somewhere between one and a million, which one am I more likely to be right in? One to a million. One to a million, because there's probably not a million cities and towns in the United in, in Massachusetts, but I know there's more than one. Right? So it's going to be in that range. If I give you this giant range, I can be fairly confident that I have the right answer. Okay? And so that's what you do. So to be more confident, you just give a bigger range. All right. So how many cities and towns are there in Massachusetts, since I've asked? I know you looked it up. 
think it's 351. Am I correct? 312 towns and 39 cities. That comes out to 351. Yes. So I already knew the answer. <laughs> um, so yeah. So, but because I've don't ask me how I know that. I don't know how, why I know that. Like I've used this before, but I knew it before I started doing it with statistics. I don't know. And I think there's like 179 countries in the world or something like that. Um, it change, that, that changes, though, because countries come and go fairly frequently. So I was pretty close. But yeah, like it, it changes fairly frequently um, because countries um, tend to uh, fight and then, um, so there's 193 countries that are members of the United Nations and two that aren't, the uh, Holy See and the State of Palestine. Okay. Um, this is the smallest country in the world, the Holy See. Does anybody know where it is? Again, don't look it up on Google. This is something you should just know. <laughs> it's one of those facts that people should just know off, you know, because it's a fairly weird fact. It has another name. The Holy See has another name. And it's near. Well, it's 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 not actually not near Italy. It's in Italy. Yeah, the Vatican, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Vatican is its own country. Um, so <laughs> I don't know why, but it is it's, its own country. Um, they have their own military. Um, like, like we went there last summer. Like, they actually have their gu guards, like, and that's their military. Um, it's just the walled city. It's, that's it. It's that tiny, it's that the walled space and a little bit around it. That's the, that's Vatican City is the Holy See. That's its own. That's the country. Um, but they wanted to be separate from Italy, so they were were not able to be seen as favoring Italy. Uh, they didn't want the Catholic Church to be favoring a country, so they broke away from Italy. But because it's in the middle of Italy, it's sitting in the middle of Italy. It's it's not. It, it, it's 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 an own. It's its own country, surrounded by another country. And there's um, other places that are like that are Monaco, um, because Monaco is just on the coast of France, but it's tiny. It's a city inside, like just on the coast, so it's not surrounded by France, but it's it's surrounded on three sides by France because that's all there is. And another one is Andorra, which is like between France and Spain, like in the mountains, and it's again this tiny little circle between these two countries that decided that, hey, we don't want to be there. And Barcelona, I think, is its own country now, too. Um, yeah, Catalonia. So, um, so, yeah, like, they broke off from Spain as well. Um, so, that's why the number changes of number of countries changes, um, because it they, like little places decide to break off from their countries because they really hate what their country is doing, um, and people are fine with that. So they and win it out. It's kind of like Ireland and North Ireland. Uh, they are not connected anymore. Or East and West Germany used to be two countries. Well, used to be one country, and then they were two countries, and now they're one country again. Um, so. The number, it's weird how the number of countries just is always in flux. Um, and so, yeah, in October of 2017, um, there was a referendum. They voted to leave Spain. It's kind of like if Florida decided, or actually, I think it would be the other way around. Florida wouldn't decide to leave the United States. I think the rest of the United States would say, you know what, we're kind of done with Florida. They really are their own thing. Let's just like let them, you know, be out there. Um, kind of like California. It's like, that's just. Too, too bizarre. Let's just get rid of it. Um, and they have enough debt 
you know, that we don't really want to be supporting Cal anymore. And their own country. They're, they're like the fifth largest, um, uh, like if California was its own country, it would be the fifth largest economy in the world and one of the largest countries in the world with 50 million people. Um, but it's got so much debt that it needs the United States to support it because um, they can't afford to be on their own. So that's what we would be doing with these. And so these items here are just not problems. Well, what would happen if we change this? What would happen if we change this? I see you're back. Um, and here they want at least a 90% confidence interval. Well, what should it end? If you want to be more confident, you just have to have more people. So you can change a couple of things. You can either change your sample size or your confidence level. And both of those things affect what you're going to do because you can't change the sample mean and you can't change the, the population innovation. Those things, this will change from sample to sample, but you can't just go, oh, we want to change the sample size, the, the, the sample mean. That's not going to happen unless you change your sample. But you can change the number of people you look at and you can tell how confident you are. And both of those things will determine what you have to do with the other one. So one and the other, because these things are static, if this goes up, this has to go up. If this goes down, this can go down, this goes down. If this goes down, this goes down. And so one of them will affect what happens to the other, and they're in the same direction. Okay. Um, this one here, people tend to get wrong just because they see uh, the standard deviation here, and they're like, oh, I need that when they write down the sample standard deviation, so that's the one they use. But they forget that they know the population standard deviation. And because we know the population standard deviation, we don't really even care what the sample standard deviation is. We're not going to do a t-distribution. Okay? Because we know the population standard deviation, this is going to be a z-distribution. Everything else stays the same. I don't think they have... Um, they do ask you to do it with a um, – nope, they're just asking you to change the distributions. So uh, this is just – this piece here is just extra information. We don't – we're writing it down because they're asking for it. But we don't care. We know this. We're going to use this. So both of these ask us what is the – do a confidence level. And it's a confidence level with the z distribution. It's a z, it's a z interval because we know the population deviation in both of these. And then they ask us, well, why are they different? And the reason they're different is because one's more confident than the other. This is 90. This is 98. So we're going to have a bigger confidence interval here than we do here. And notice those numbers are larger. The spread is larger because we are more confident that the population mean is between those two numbers, all right? And this stuff here is still the same. This is still going, this CL is still going to be whatever the confidence level is. And then alpha over two is just half of whatever's left. Half of whatever's left. 98, there's two left. Divide two by two and we get the 0.01, all right? Uh, this is still calculated the same with these two numbers. Subtract them, divide by two. Um, what does it mean? Well, like I said, it means that if we did this over and over again, tons of samples, 90% of the time, uh, we would have the population mean in them. It doesn't mean that we're sure about it 90% of the time. It means that 90% of the time, population mean is actually in there. Is it? If we only do it once, we may not have the population mean because it's a 90% confidence that it would have one of those 10% of the times where we are wrong. Right? This is why statistics gets you know, one of the reasons to gets a bad rap is because you're doing math and the math, the answers could be even though the math is all right. right? You don't have to be. So when they ask who's going to win the election and they tell you Biden is ahead, you know, by seven points, they could be wrong because you can lie. <laughs> you know, they may not ask the right people. 
you know they may only be like when they say oh after the um the the uh um debates they're like well we have 15 undecideds here and uh they're all saying they're going to vote for biden and then you ask about ask the, the uh undecideds well who are they and Every one of them voted for Hillary Clinton the year before the election before, and every one of them has always voted for a Democrat. They're not undecided. They are Democrats. But undecided is a person who really has no clue and probably has never voted. Most people can be undecided. Everybody else probably has already taken a side. As soon as we found out who was going to be in the election, they're like, "All right, I'm not voting for that person." You know, and. It, they may have voted for Donald Trump before, but then they saw, well, who was running against him? They're like, yeah, I like him better. Or they may have voted for Hillary Clinton before, and they looked and said, Biden's not the right guy for me. And things are going okay, I'm going to vote for Trump. But very few people, you know, at this point in time are like, yeah, no, I don't have no idea who I'm voting for. I just don't want to tell you. All right. And so the undecideds at this point are, there's no such thing. Unless the person has no clue what's going on in the world, uh, there are no undecided people. Like we, there's there's a definite, you know, they may lean, they may they may be leaning one way or the other. They may, but usually, even if they're leaning at point, they're probably going to vote that way. They've kind of made, they've made their decision. Very few people who are leaning are going to then say, yeah, no, I'm not going to vote for that person, unless something horrible happens, you know. Then they'll then they change their mind. But most cases, if you have any inclination of who you think you want to vote for, you're not your mind is not going to be changed by anything that happens in the elections. So all that stuff that they put on the news is a farce because they have no idea what's about statistics. They know nothing about st they they know nothing about most things. Um, but they know nothing about statistics, and so they get it wrong all the time. You know, especially when they're talking about increases, a percentage of percent inc percent increases. They don't know the difference between increasing a number by 10% or increasing 10% um, uh, of a number. So they they don't they and they use them the same. So there's a big difference between going from 70 uh, 70. You know, I have a 70% and I'm increasing this 10%, that could be 80% or it could be to 77%. Because if I'm increasing 10%, I'm adding 10%. But if I'm increasing by 10%, I've increased it by 10% of this number. So they and people don't necessarily know the difference between the two of them, especially when you're in the media. Uh, and they use them interchangeably as if they're the same thing. So those are things you need to, to realize that, you know, there's lots. It's not that there's fake news necessarily on purpose. It's that they have no idea what they're talking about. And the people put things up there that are just wrong. So and these things happen because of statistics. They don't get what this stuff means. So that's why I'm here to fix that. All right. Um, so this one here, number four, we have a list of data. All right. We know nothing else. So because we don't know anything else, we don't know the population standard deviation. And so we have to do a T distribution because we have this data. If they'd said, here's our list of data and here's the population standard deviation, then we would. Um, Put that in there, but because we don't know anything, we have to calculate those pieces. And here they're asking us for the mean, population mean and population standard deviation, and we don't know them. So we're going to go back to stats, and this time because we have to put this data in, we have to go to edit. And I'm going to clear this stuff out. And I'm going to clear this stuff out. And I'm going to just type in my numbers 
right? And I obviously missed one because it says I have nine things and I only have eight here. So let's go back and start over again. So 2.6, 2.9, 3.0, 2.3. Okay, so now I have nine things. Okay. And so having the wrong data will give you the wrong answer. No matter, it doesn't matter. We're going to get the wrong answer because things are going to happen. All right, so I need to know my means and standard deviations. Well, I don't have any of that stuff. So we're going to go back all the way back again to Chapter 2, Stat, Calc. And I'm calculating one variable statistics. And I have my list in L1, and I don't have anything here. And I calculate, and it gives me my mean and my sample standard deviation. This is the one I care about, the S of X. Okay, because I have this. This is the population mean standard deviation. This is the sample standard deviation. So I care about that number. All right, and so I put those both in. It told me my sample size was nine, so those things are all there. What is n minus one? Well, if I have nine and I take one away, that's how you get that. Pretty self-explanatory, so I don't think I'm going to go into that. We all get out of first grade, right? Nobody's still dealing with first grade math. We can all subtract one. Everybody can subtract one from stuff. Feel comfortable with that, even without a calculator? Just checking. I'm going to go through the silence being yes. All right. So in part B, uh, what does X mean? I'm guessing this is going to ask me what X bar means. Oh, look, it does. So common questions. I'm not going to go over them again. OK, what is the degrees of freedom? So this is tricky. You have to put this in correctly, because otherwise it will mark it wrong. Okay, so the degrees of freedom, this is going to be a T distribution. Okay, so we have to put the T in. All right, and then the degrees of freedom is this N minus 1. If I type in T8 and hit enter, or I have to come down here and submit it, I guess. It marks it wrong, okay, because this subscript. And so to get that subscript, we have to go to functions. So when we come in here, we're going to go to functions. And this one here allows me to put a subscript in. And then I can put an 8. It seems really dumb to me that this has to be like this, but it has to be like this. Because if I just wrote T of 8, people know what that is. And so now it marks it correct. So you have to go to functions and put in the subscript. That will give you the ability to write this number in here. OK? And like I said, if you don't do that, you're going to get it wrong. And then why did you use the T distribution? Well, because we don't know the population standard deviation. Basically, that's it really has nothing to do with the size of the sample. We don't know the population standard deviation. We're going to use the t-distribution. I mean, if had this been infinitely large, then we would use we could use the z. But basically, if it's not infinity, then uh, we're going to use the t-distribution. And the reason it's called the student t-distribution is because the person who invented it was a student of math of, of statistics. All right, has an interesting story. Uh, he this this person worked for Guinness. Yes, that is not. We got you know, the Breakfast of Champions, right? You don't know which one Guinness we're talking about. Um, uh, beer. It's not just for breakfast anymore. That Guinness. Um, and he wanted to see was the hops right, but he didn't know the population standard deviation, so he just used his sample standard deviation and said, you know what, 
I'm going to build some error, more error into this. And so he came up with this distribution on his own. And people looked at it and studied it and said, yeah, it's, it's, it's right. It's good enough. So that's where those numbers came from. That's it. They, they built the standard deviations into the idea and they built the, the degrees of freedom in, came up with the tables and that's it. That's how it works. There's, you know, a, um, I'm assuming there's probably a, a formula for the curves that they have uh, with the distributions, but that's all it was. I don't know where the T came from. Um, it, it's called students T distribution, but we just shortened it to T distribution. I'm guessing because S was already taken for other things, T wasn't. So it has a couple of T's in there, so they went with T distribution. Uh, he named it. Maybe his name was Timothy. I don't know. But we have no idea who he is, except that he was a student of statistics. We don't know his name or anything about him. So, I mean, here, we can even uh, who invented CT distribution. Oh, we do know his name. Wow, I didn't know we knew his name. Uh, oh, he probably was under the student, no pseudonym student. I never knew that. I never knew he had a name. William Seeley Gossett. Now I'm interested. The hidden story. No, I don't want to donate. I don't. I barely want to uh, use you. You have an ads on here to choke my screen. Um, you worked at the Guinness Brewery in Dublin. That I knew. Um, that's what I was always taught. I never taught his name. Uh, Englishman publishing under the pseudonym student. Um, all right. Well, why was it called the T distribution? I know that part, but why to T? Why, why is it T? Where did the T come from? Hmm. Okay, we get that, but why? Why is it T? Why, where did the T come from? I don't know. He called it the students T. He called it the T distribution. Maybe it was T time. I have no idea why he called it the T time, T distribution. But at least I now have it. That makes me feel good. All right. So then, do the confidence interval. Well, again, it's going to be the same steps, except so we're going to go to stat, tests, and we're going to go to the T interval. Now, we could we could use the statistics that were calculated, and they're in there, or we could just go to the data and use that. And because we have the data, we're better off using the data just in case we type something in wrong with the statistics. So if I get this, it actually gives me my mean and standard deviation again. So I could have just done the, the T distribution and gotten this information. I could have found these pieces there because it tells me my X bar, it tells me my S of X, and it tells me my sample size. So I could have done that without having to you know, use the um, one variable statistics. It would have given me these values here. And then it gives me my range. And again, these numbers are going to go here as well. These numbers here are still being calculated the same. This is my confidence level. This is what's left over on both sides. This is still the same. I take the difference of these two and divide it by two. So all those pieces are the same. It's just that we're using the t distribution instead of the z distribution. And because we had data, 
actual data, we use the data option versus the statistics. We could have used the statistics. Stats. If I do this and go to calc, ooh, I need to put in 95%. That's the only thing I forgot to do wrong. I didn't do right. Calculate. I'm going to get the same values, whether I did it with data or whether I did it with statistics. Right? It's just that these here may be off because of rounding. So that's why I always you should always use the data in those cases. Because if I just rounded this at 2.51 and this 0.33, I'd be off a little bit. Right, and you're better off using the data because you get more accurate values. And what does 95% confident mean? It still means that 95% of the time, the population mean is in that range. So nothing has changed on most of these. The only thing that changed on this is that we're using the T versus the Z. And in this case, we use the data versus the statistics. But we could, like I said, we could have used the stats because it was already in there. In these problems here, we're looking at, I'm going to skip five because it just asks, well, what is, um, oh, no, actually, I'm not going to skip five. So in five, they're asking us, how many people do we need to survey? All right. And there's a quick way which gives you an estimate. It's not perfect, but it gives you an estimate. Okay. So we know from the empirical rule that 95% of the data is within two standard deviations. Okay, so to find n, So we're going to take Z star, or the Z score. I'll just get rid of that. And square it. Multiply it by the probability of success times the probability of failure, and divide that by our error. OK? So what do those things mean? Well. If we're 95% confident, Z is approximately 2, right? Because we were always we're told, like I said, we're told in the uh, empirical uh, um, rule that two standard Z that 95% of the data is within two standard deviations, and it's true because it's really within it's really 1.96. Z score of uh, 1.96 and the 95% um, value for 1.96 for uh, Z is 1.96. And so that's close enough to two for doing this to get a quick value. Now, when we don't know what the probability of success and the probability of failure are, so in this case here, they're asking. How many people wear seatbelts? We don't know. Um, buckle up. Yeah, wear their seatbelts. But it could be on anything. You know, who are you going to vote for for president? And I don't know. All right. I have no idea how many people are going to vote for Trump. Like what portion of people are going to vote for Trump? So what I can do is I can guess. And to do that, I can, I'm going to get, multiply these two things together. So if I find that zero people are going to vote for Trump. That's going to be multiplied by 100% of the population is not going to vote for Trump. And then if 10% vote for Trump, then 0.9% of the 90% of the population didn't vote for Trump. I don't want to infinite pages. I just want to move stuff. Ah, it's over here. This one. 
Thank you. And if 20% of the population votes for Trump, then 80% didn't. And if 30%, then this is 70%, and 40%, this is 60%, and if this is 50%, and the people who didn't is 50%, and so on. Point four times point three times point two times point one times zero. And if I multiply these out, I get zero and then up zero point oh nine point one six point two one point two four point two five point two four point two one point one six point zero nine and zero again. So which of these is the highest number? Anybody want to guess? Point two five. Good job. That. Excellent. So 0.25 is the highest number. So to get the biggest value, I'm going to assume that 80% of the people are voting for him, 80% aren't. Okay. So I'm going to come back up here. And so if P and Q are 0.5, Point five times point five. Because we don't know those. Right? So that's the biggest thing we can get. If Z, if we want to be 95% confident, well, I can use this, but this is quicker. I know two squared. I can do that in my head. That's four, right? So I get four times point two five. Well, what's how much is four quarters? One. It's one. <laughs> so I end up with one over e squared. So whatever my error is, however accurate I want to be, however I want big I want my error bound to be, that I put in, I divide by one, I divide it into one, I square it and divide it into one. That'll tell me how many people I need to, about how many people I need to survey. So knowing that, if I'm doing a proportion and I want to be within 5% accuracy, that's really a really, really bad survey, by the way, you know, having 5% error. But if I wanted to be, have 5% error, I'm going to just divide 1 by 5% squared, and I'm going to interview 400 people. If I want to be, most surveys are 3%. They're plus or minus 3%. That means they're... You, we add and subtract 3% to what they say, and that's where they believe they are. They have to interview just over 1,000 people. And if you want to be within 1%, you have to interview 10,000 people. So. This is why we're never this accurate because that takes a lot of money. 
This is why they use 3% because it's about a thousand people. And why we don't use 5% because that's just too far. So that means I have a 10% spread. And so if I find out that you know my result is 54 versus um, 46, well, that's a completely useless information because I can add and subtract five to both of those and it switches. So here I'm probably correct, but I have to interview a lot more people. Here I have a nice round, about a thousand people. If I interview a thousand people, I'll get pretty close to 3%. It'll be just a little over 3%, or like 3.7 or something, 3.4%. Um, and I can then, um, I can find out what my value is, and I can, I can exactly find that out. I can do one divided by a thousand, and then take the square root of that. And I'm at 3.2%. So this is my error is 3.2%. If I interview a thousand people, I'm on about 3.2% error. So most people are all good enough, are okay with that. So, and a thousand isn't a lot to ask, you know, especially when you're doing robocalls. You know, you can get that pretty quickly and it's not expensive. So, and especially since they're doing a presidential election, they have to ask 50,000 people because they have to ask all 50 states. So that's why doing 10,000 makes no sense because they'd have to interview a half a million people. That's a lot, you know. So this is why they're usually in this 3% range. And so they can get that value and say, okay, well, we're within 3%. So if we add or subtract 3% to this and we come out with, you know, 46 versus 54, well, it's still that the person who is 54% is still winning in our in our in our samples okay but that's 95% confidence so that means that 5% of the time they're still wrong okay they haven't found the population stand, the, the population proportion not 5% of the time right and especially when you tell people that oh one person is really great and the other person is a racist, you know, and is equals is the same as Hitler. People tend to not tell you the truth. <laughs> they they don't tend to tell you that. Oh, hey, we're, I'm for the guy who's you, you're calling Hitler, the, the second coming of Hitler. People tend to not want to be in that category, so they tend to lie to you. Um, so it's really hard uh, with bias. This is why having biased journalism is really bad. Okay, and all, and unfortunately, it's the biased journalists, journalists who then report this data. So it's a vicious cycle. They tell you that this person is horrible, and they ask you about the person, and then they report this finding as those are the statistics. So, and it, it they and it continues to build on that, and and they're like, well, why did Trump win? Well, we found all these things. We were really positive that Hillary Clinton was going to win and crush, you know, Donald Trump, and Oh, people lied to us. They lied to our faces. How dare they? The people are horrible. Yes, she was right. They are incorrigible. They are uh, dirty humans. We hate them. And but we're going to continue. So it, it never ends. Right? And I realize I get on my soapbox about this, and I probably shouldn't. But um, it's what makes, like, I like statistics, and journalism has kind of ruined it. Um, because of the fact that when you report something and then use those, then use those reports to create uh, surveys to find data that supports what you've just said is really wrong. If you need to take your, they need to take themselves out of it and just give the facts and then go, what do you think? And then they can get real results. But because we don't do that anymore, most news is opinion. It kind of ruins all um, validity in surveys that they get, and it's on both sides. So because people tend to stay within their bubbles and don't, um, and then if you ask people, they only hear the one thing that they want to hear, and they're like, "Oh, I'm just dismiss the other thing. I know that's wrong and crap." So they don't listen to the other side because again, it's all opinion, and when you 
ask them, they looked and they listened to see how are you asking the questions, and that's going to determine how I'm going to respond to you. Because uh, I get calls all the time because I'm unenrolled. Preach. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. It's 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 just that I like statistics and it's been tainted, and I hate that. You know, um, it's not that I hate the new, like news is good. We need to find stuff out. And yes, I have my opinions politically, but I try to keep those out of it because it's still wrong on both sides. But um, and I, don't, I can't fix because I'm one person. And I teach, I've taught a lot of people statistics over the years because I have 20 kids in a class per semester. I teach, I've been teaching this two semesters, sometimes three. So I see 60 kids a year, you know, 40 to 60 kids a year. And I've been teaching this for 10 years. So I've seen about 500 people. And I can get my, that's a small portion of really who needs to know this stuff. Uh, so you're going to do the same thing that I just did, except that you're going to find out that 95% is really 1.96. All right. And they want to have, so remember I was getting 10,000 people. Because this isn't exactly two, that number doesn't come out clean. And you have to round up. You always round up when you get a, a, a part of a person because if you ask a part of a person you have to ask the whole person right so if I found that the answer was um, 206.1 it's 207 if I find it's 206.8 it's still 207 people so it doesn't matter what part of the person I have to I, I get I have to round up for the whole thing so this is the only place where rounding up is always the case all right um, we never round down in these. Um, and so here, if we need to be more than 95% confident, we have to ask more people because that's if this is going to be higher, this has to be higher, and it just works out that way. So, so how do you find that 9,604 if you're? Because I try to enter like it with how you did it but I couldn't get the right answer. Right. So because we don't because this one so one point let me get to the thing. Right. So what we're gonna be using is really N we're still gonna be using this same thing, Z squared times P times Q over e squared. Make that e a little better, all right? But z is going to be 1.96. Oops. That was not an. That was a six. Oh, I should have just kept on that. That's like somebody's reading the table. 1.96 squared. times 0.5 because again we don't know unless they tell us that 70% of the people in previous you know things 70% of the people have done this we just assume that it's always going to be 0.5 and 0.5 because we don't know divided by what it, by whatever the e is and i think in my case it was uh, 0.01 All right so 95% has a z value of 1.96 uh, 90% is 1.645 and 99% is um I've forgotten it I think it's like 2.5 Five seven five at two point five seven five. So those are Z scores that they like I just know because like this one's the this most one's common the most one. Common. And these two are less. 
Um, but it just, they were just, I had to do them so many times, they were just drilled into my head. You know, um, we never, we always did these three, depending upon what things we were looking at. Um, so you're going to do 1.96 squared times 0.25 divided by 0 0.01 squared. So I get 1.96 squared times 0.5 times 0.5 divided by 0 0.01 squared. And they give you the 9,604. Okay, so you can just type this in just as it is here because nothing happened. Nothing is going to be out of order of operations. These squares are going to happen first, and then it's going to do this multiplication and then this division. So because everything is at uh, levels, so we don't have to worry about putting things in parentheses that you know or anything like, like making sure this happens first because it's fine. It's going to do these squarings and then it's going to multiply and then it's going to divide. So it will give you. It'll actually give you those numbers. And had it been a, if you have a 3%, then obviously this changes to 3. And you find it's 1,068 people. So it's still just around 1,000. And had this gone up, had this 95% gone up, Let's say they went to 99%. So this would be 2.575. So that's 99% confidence at 0 0.01 error. We'd get 16,577 people, which still isn't a lot. And that's not a lot of people. You know, so relatively right? speaking, um, mine. So mine says like 95% of the drivers with a confidence level of 0 0.05. So yep. I enter 1.96 squared times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5, and I divide 0 0.05 squared. Yes. Right. Well, I get 384.16. So I put in 384, and it says I'm wrong. You have to so round up. Wrong. You have to round up. Yeah, so I round. Oh, I have to round up to 385. Correct. It says oh, round your answer said. up. Uh, okay. Yep. <laughs> because if you're doing even a part of a person, you have to ask that whole person. So you never round down because you'll always be less accurate. You'll have okay. an error that will be my bigger than farting. <laughs> yes. Yes. But it's I very have a easy. Question. Yes. Um, What's that? I just have a quick question before you move on. As far as the common confidence levels, you say that the 90% um, one is 1.645. Yes. And in the lecture, it says to round, you have it just as 1.64. So oh. if you were ever doing it just with two decimal places, would it actually be 1.65? Yes, 1.64. Um, actually, I guess it might be a little, oh, maybe it's 1.64. All right. I just, for some reason, have always had a, had a five when I'm talking, but I guess it is just 1.64. So maybe I'm there. Now it's 1.64. And I, like here they have this one is 2.58, but I know that one's 0.575. Um, again, just one of those things. But, you know, for two decimal places is perfectly fine. So if you want to have 2.58, that's fine too. So, but yeah, like this is the one you're going to use the most, this 95%. And like I said, that's why we changed it to two because two is easy. Like this math comes out really simple and you're a little, you're a little more accurate than 95%. So the, the math is easier to do and um, you get a bigger, you know, you'll have a larger sample, just a little bit. It's only a few more people. Um, but, and it's you're a little more accurate, but the math is so much simpler. This is just turned out to be one. <laughs> so being a math person, I like simple math. I can do that in my head. I don't know what 1.96 is. 
is squared. So um, when you go on to the next one here, we're going to have a proportion um, confidence interval. So here they surveyed people and they found out they surveyed 450 people and 340 of them buckle up. So that's where they get the X in the end. And is still the sample size, and X is the number of successes. And then P prime is just what is that as a decimal? I just take these two numbers and do the division to get P prime. So this is the point estimate. Okay, I think the last question asks you, what is the point estimate? This is just another term for it. The sample standard deviation, the sample mean, those are the point estimates. So if it asks you what's the point estimate and they're talking about means, it's just the sample mean. If they're asking you the point estimate and they're talking about proportions, it's the sample proportion. It's just a fancy term. I don't know. I never even, I, uh, until I started using this book, I'd never heard of it as point estimate, but now I've, like I said, I've been using this book for 10 years. So it's just like, oh, I don't think about it. It's kind of a dumb term, um, but it's just whatever that we find the sample to be. So what is X and what is P prime? So X again is the number who actually do it and P prime is the proportion of people who do it in our sample. This here is where we care about Q, all right? So, because we have to find the standard deviation. I don't know why. Like, we're not going to use it for anything, but because it's normally distributed, we have to have the mean and the standard deviation. The mean is just the proportion, the sample proportion. And then this thing, because we haven't even talked about it yet, ever. is the square root of p times q over n. That was really, really horrible. I'm going to try that all again. The square root. P. Am I, oh, I'm doing one minus P. One minus P over N. Or square root of P times Q over N. So I have to take the proportion. I have to take what's left of the, like, what's left. 1 minus b, the probability of success, the probability of failure, and then divide it by the sample size, and then take the square root of it. So in this case, I have um, 0.7556. p equals 0.75. 5, 6, and n is 340 or 50. So to find this, to find my standard deviation, clear all this out, 1 minus point. Seven five five six is that. So Q is point two four four four. I want to multiply that by point seven five five six. Get so that's what this top thing is. Divide by four fifty. So that's what this thing in the middle, inside is. So I have four. 0.137 times 10 to the negative fourth power. So if I have to move this decimal point four places. And then I take the square root of it. So second square root, second answer. And I get 0 0.02025, whatever. And that's where this comes from.
because I have to I'm the rounding to four decimal places. So 0 0.02025, 0 I round up. So that's where the three comes from. So that's what you have to do you have to take your proportion that they've given you. Your, this is your P prime. Times Q prime, which is just one minus B. Divide it, multiply those together, divide by our sample size, then take the square root of it. So to do that, you can just do it in steps as you go along. Find what one minus P is, so find Q. Multiply those two numbers together. Take that answer, divide by 450, or your sample size. And then second square root, second negative will give you the answer, because that's what this says right above there. How do you get the answer inside the square root? So, so if I do this second negative sign, right above the negative sign says answer. So whenever I do that, so I'll clear this one out. So second square root, second answer. It just puts the negative inside the square root thing. And that's how I get that. And this is the only thing you're going to, that's the only place you're going to need that. It, we don't use it for anything. We don't calculate this stuff by hand. So um, we don't care. <laughs> like, this is the only place that it, that it matters is just in this one little question. And then why do we use the um, normal distribution? Because it's a proportion. That's it. There's no other reason. So, and notice the other things say student, student, binomial. So um, none of those things are working because we're not. Yes, this is a binomial because there's two outcomes. You, you plug it in, you use your seatbelt or you don't. Um, but we're not asking about what, it, what kind of distribution it is. Um, we're building the normal distribution because we're, that's what we, we have a proportion. We know the proportions when we do, um, uh, um, confidence levels are always going to follow the normal curve. So that's why. I mean, the binomial becomes a normal distribution when the binomial distribution, distribution gets large enough. So when the sample size gets large enough. So that's what's happening here. And again, this is a sample of from everything. So it's not just of, um, it's not just one time through. This is continuous samples. And then they ask us to find the confidence levels. Well, again, we're going to go to stat, tests. We come down to confidence levels. And so there's one proportion and two proportion. People always go in and go, oh, I'm doing a Z interval because this is a proportion. And they pick this one. And they're like, well, where's the standard deviation? Where's the mean? We don't have means. We have proportions. That's why they have one proportion and two proportion. proportion. So make sure you're using this one, not this one. And so it asks us, what is our sample uh, successes? What is our sample size? So I had 340, and I have 450. And what's my confidence level that I'm doing? 95%. Uh, and I hit calculate, and it gives me my ranges. That goes the stuff that goes here. And the stuff that goes here. These are still the same things. This is my confidence level. This is the error that's left over on each side divided by two. And this is the same thing. We take these two numbers, subtract them, and divide by two. And that's what we added to um, our sample proportion here, this 0.7556. We added this number to it to get this one, and we subtracted this number from it to get that one. So that's where that error bound comes from. So we take these two numbers, divide, subtract them, divide by two. And that will give us that thing. And then um, if the survey was done over the phone, what are some uh, 
problems with it? Well, um, it's not accurate because not everybody has a phone in their house anymore. Uh, most people, a lot of people have cell phones. So if you're of a younger age, you may not have a landline. Um, this is probably true <laughs> because um, although it's probably not 24, it's probably a little, the age number is different. The, the, the age is probably different, but this is why this is not true because like there's a certain age group that no longer has, a, has phones in their houses. I don't know what it is, but it's becoming you know more and more popular to not have a landline. We have a landline because we have bad reception in our house on our cell phones. So we have to have a landline because otherwise you can't hear me when I'm talking. I have to go outside. And even that doesn't always work because if I'm down on the ground, you can't hear me because the house is in the way. So like um, children uh, who do not answer the phone will not be included. Well, OK, but we weren't really asking them when they're driving because children shouldn't be driving in the first place. Um, they don't tell the truth because they're told you should buckle up. It's the law, so they may be lying about that. It's you know similar things. You know we don't you know, like whenever we're told that we have to do something, we tend to say yeah we're doing it until we get caught not doing it. So you know do you wear a mask? Yeah, I always wear a mask. And then you're like you know I hate wearing a mask. I don't wear a mask unless I really have to, like unless I'm inside teaching my classes. I'm you know like. Like if I'm outside, I'm not wearing a mask because you know we're outside, you know. Um, but we're told we have to wear masks. So if I, people do they change this from buckling up to wearing a mask? Most people would say they wear a mask. Um, they may or may not participate in the phone survey. You know, you get a phone survey. It's dinner time. You're cooking. You're like, I don't have time to answer your stupid questions, and you hang up. Or you're like, who's calling? And you you don't you see it's not your wife or your kids or your mother-in-law so you don't bother answering the phone because you're cooking, you know? Um, so that's the problems with calling people on the phone and asking them. You know, so that's why it's those things. This one I always feel uncomfortable with and I'll let you know up ahead of time. I'm changing this to cars. <laughs> uh, um, I don't really want to talk about this. Um, so they ask, uh, people, what kind of cars do they have? And they asked 1,707 people how many, what kind of cars they had. And these are uh, blue cars, and these are red cars, and these are white cars, and these are black cars, right? Or these are the people that they asked. Um, and they found that Asians, 79% of them have a red car. Say, you know, 71% have a like a red with like a blue car, and 65% with like a, a green car and we'll just leave it at that and you can uh, read it and understand why I don't like the question. Um, from that, they want to then create a, um, they want to find 95% confidence intervals of those three things. Okay. And so what we're doing is we're finding the confidence intervals of, you know, this number, knowing that there are um, 255 Asian people in my survey. The rest of it is complete. We don't care about any of the rest of this, right? But you know, 255 Asians were asked, and 79% of them said they'd want a white car. Uh, so we can look at that and go, all right. So seventy nine percent are my is my P and um, my N was two hundred and fifty five. All right. I need when I put this into my calculator. And I go to stats and tests, and one proportion is the intervals. OK, I have my Z. I mean, so I have my N. My N is 255. 
what's my tax? I, I, it's 79% above 255. Right. But if I put that in, I'm not going to get I'm going to get 201.45. I don't get a whole number. And so when I run this, I'm going to get an error because I can't have partial successes. Okay? So you have to round. And because this is 201.45, I'm going to round down. All right. And that's so 201 people out of 255 people, that's what gave me, gave me about 79%. And I can see it's 78.8%. So, yeah, that's probably what they did. And so here's my proportion, here's my Z intervals for that value. And again, um, so here I have 73.73. Eight, one, and point eight three, eight four, and it's going to take it because I rounded down. I think if I round up, I still get the, I get the numbers. I said this was 202. I get numbers that are much higher, and so my uh, space is, is is smaller. So, and I have more than 79%. But I think these might work as well. Let's see, 0. 0.7424. and 0. 0.8420. Uh, oh, I have too many decimal places. I'll put two decimal places in because two decimal points because it doesn't understand that. And so it takes that as well. So I could have rounded in either direction. And it would have accepted those as answers because this also rounds to 79%. So either way, um, like it, but if it marks it wrong, then round in the other direction, okay, for the other two. And then what it's going to ask us is, are there overlaps? And we can see that this number here is. Um, I'm going to take a screenshot. of this stuff, and I'm going to paste it into my okay. So I can see that this number here And this number here overlaps. So here, this one it goes from, uh, if I was putting this on a number line, this one goes from 0 0.7400, and this is 0 0.8400. And this one goes from here to here, and we have 0.6543 and 0.7657. 
I think I get better at this as I go along. So because there's overlap in this space, all right, then this here might actually be smaller than this here. Okay, because the true number, the true proportion, we're, we're looking for what is the true proportion. And so the true proportion of this could be, you know, this number right here, you know, 741, 0 0.741, 0 0.7412. And the true proportion here could be 0 0.7511. So this value could actually be higher than this value. And that's what it that's what it's looking for at overlap. So that's what it means when we have overlap is that they may actually be at different spaces. And this one here goes from here to oops. goes from here to here. And this is 0 0.7181, 0 0.7181. And because there is no overlap between the red line and the blue purple line, this is always going to be higher than that one. Okay. There's no, there's never a the, according to our, our um, confidence levels, there's no chance of this purple line ever being higher than this red line. Okay, if everything, if we are correct, if our 90% confidence levels are true, there's no way for the red line to be smaller than the purple line. All right, and that's because there's no overlap. And that's what they're asking about in uh, this question. Are there overlaps? Uh, what do the overlaps mean? And what are the fact that there aren't overlaps? If there's something doesn't overlap something, what does that mean? So that's what they're asking about in that one. And in this last one, the point estimate is just the estimate, just what they found the, the their survey to be based upon their sample size and their number of successes. So this number here gives us this value. That's the point estimate. So. The, you don't have to calculate anything. They've already given you the answer. They're just asking you, do you know what point estimate means? And point estimate just means the sample proportion. So um, I left you a couple to do. Not a lot of them to do, but um, like I, I didn't do the work out for you on all of them. But I've given you, I think, enough to get all of them done. I do believe there is a test coming up, if I'm not mistaken. Let me um, where are the uh, future? Future, come on. Um, next week, I guess. Um, available tomorrow. So it opens tomorrow by Monday, okay, so right before election day. So the, the test will open tomorrow. It's on chapters um, four, six, and seven. Correct? Yes, because we did two and three. Uh, so it's still the same thing. There's still 25 questions. Um, you still have three chances to answer each question. Um, some of them are multiple choice. Some of them are open-ended. Um, I'll, if you're interested, I'll show you what the test is on. I mean, you can see. Oh, that's not the one I want. Uh, edit. That's the one I want. So there's nine questions on chapter um, uh, four, I think. Oh. Nine chapters on chapter six, seven, and eight. That's not right. That's not right. <laughs> 
That's wrong. Or did we do two, three? No, did we do have tests on two, three, and four? Or was it just two and three? Two and three. So this is wrong. Um, let me fix that because that's not good. Um, change anything don't uh, future test three test two well but I want to see this t test do I also have test uh, eight in chapter in test three because that should be on eight nine and ten <laughs> Nine, 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 ten, twelve, chapter twelve, chapter twelve. So, um, weird. Um, I'm gonna move to test eight, my test two, because it'll have chapter eight in it. So I'm going to move it, move it back a week, but I'm going to add chapter four because somehow I never put stuff from chapter four in. Um, so how do I fix that? Um, I'm just going to move the uh, test eight, I think, I just test two back a week because it doesn't have chapter four. It has chapter eight, and that way chapter eight gets covered. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we'll just... Pretend chapter four doesn't exist, and I'll just test one next semester. So we're looking at taking the test in two um, in two weeks. Uh, uh yeah. Uh, well, I'm gonna move it back. I think one week is that way. Like it'll be after the homework is due. So this homework isn't due for another week. Um, cause hold on. Why is this taking forever? Come on. Any day, any day now. Don't need to save my preference. There's nothing that was happening in it. Come on, you silly machine. Computers go off them. Oh. Any day now. Oh, good. Um, so let me go to schedule. This is due November 1st. So I'm going to move this to the week after. So it'll open up on November 2nd. Um, let me just. Look. Dates in this. It'll open up next. So instead of being, I moved it back, so it's gonna open up on the first. Because chapter, what's today? Today's the twenty fourth. Yeah. When is chapter eight due? This opens today. So chapter is, eight isn't due this Sunday, but it would be due the next, the following Sunday. Next Sunday, right? And then, um, yeah, and then the test will open up that day. Test will open up uh, that Sunday. Oh but no, it should be Saturday. Uh, edit schedule. Um, is available uh, 
So it'll be available October 31st? Yeah. Okay. Is that what I usually do? I, I, I'm, not, I'm completely befuddled. I can't even think of my, yeah, my brain is not working. Do. I, I like I've had one test, so I can't remember what it was like. Uh, when did I make it available? I oh, know I, I made that available on Sunday too, so that's right. So there's, no, but I thought I made it available at like noon, like after this class was over. Um, there it is. Hour one hour after class. Starts okay. Um, so I'll make it three hours after class starts. <laughs> yeah, so it's it'll open up at noon on Saturday. So after this class is over on Halloween, you can have a test. You can have a test, <laughs> and it won't be due until that Monday. So you'll have plenty of time to work on it. So it won't be due for another week. Correct. So I moved everything. I moved it all back one week. Okay. We just change this so it has the right things. Yeah, that's better. And I'm going to fix the other ones as I go along. Let me find test three. Will chapter four be? Uh, no, it's just going to be. It's going to be six, seven, and eight. So we skip chapter four. This three hours class. Right, so that's four, and then where's fifteen? Oh, test four. Okay. Uh, so the test date, start date is eleven. I uh, know it's Halloween, so it'll be, you'll it'll open up on. Right after class ends on Halloween, um, and then it won't it won't be due until the Monday afterwards. So if you forgot to do this week's the, the last test, you really want to make sure you get this one done. And because um, I had some people who didn't do last the last test, um, it happens. Um, but I'm just reminding where did my stuff go? Did it get closed? Did I close? I closed it. Oh, no, I didn't. Um, three hours. Oh, okay. So, um, and then test four is on, I believe, chapters. Uh, so test three is on chapters nine, ten, and twelve, and test four is on chapters eleven and thirteen. So I've got to fix test one for next semester so that it has ch chapters two, three, and four, and then move that back a week too. So, um, so we will be everything will be fixed, or maybe I'll just make a test for test four. I don't know, chapter four. I don't know. I'll figure it out. Um, but so I'll work with that. I'll worry about that next semester when I forget and then have to go all through it again. Uh, so the test I was wrong isn't going to be this week. It's going to be next week. And it's on chapters six, seven, and eight. Where you got that? Got it. Got it. Cool. That's two, six, seven, and eight. Yes, perfect. Um, anything else that I've forgotten that anybody has questions about doesn't understand we just make sure that there's messages I have 13 messages <laughs> so those are extension requests I'll deal with those later um, I care about these first Uh, chapter six. Struggling with these questions. Not sure why there's an X. Okay. Um, so we are interested in 
fewer than 190 feet. Oh, okay, so that's not the, the question. You get this part right. You were, it's asking about this one here. Um, so when we are looking at this, if we, and this is chapter six, which is not, which is just X. So we have our distributions. So second VARs, this is a normal CDF. Okay. And we're interested in fewer than 190 feet. So this is going to go from negative infinity up to 190 feet, where our mean is 240, our standard deviation is 46. Oh. 190, our mean is 240, our standard deviation is 46. We graph that, and that's going to give us our value. So I'm not quite sure where you get this. I have no idea where you get this 5.5. I couldn't even, because remember, all areas have to, under curves, have to be less than 1. So I'm not sure where you get this 5.5 at all. And then on the next one, um, Find the 80th percentile, so that's inverse norm. So inverse normal, where the area is 0.8, and again, our means were 190 and 46. And we find, oh, was it 240? 240 and 96. 246. So we get the 278. That's where that one comes from. And the graph, 80% of the values are below this number. So we have to find the ones that are below. And that's the only one. And then what is this? Well, again, 80th percentile, that's the probability that it's less than um, this 278. So that's all that's asking. So that's how those work. You got to remember to. Put in the values, use your uh, normal distribution for that. So I hope that answers that question. Um, so this here is algebra. Okay. C given D is equal to probability of C and D divided by the probability of D. So we have stuff. We're, we're looking for this. This is our unknown. We know this. We know this. So 0. 0.7 equals X divided by 0. 6 and we just solve for x. That's how they got that. And then we use this to find the other one, which is the probability of d given c. So we can't find this until we find this. But now that we have this, we know probability of c, we can solve for d given c. So that's how, how, that's how you get those two done. OK? Um, I think that's everything. Uh, class dismissed. You guys all have a good one. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. I'm going to try my hardest. Thank you. All right, I'm going to stop the.